Hello everyone, I'm Mark Selleck and welcome back to Casting Through Ancient Greece, episode 49, Miletus, with Professor Vanessa Gorman. Well, we are going to have one last look at the region of Anatolia with today's episode. Like I have said in the previous episode, I decided to hold back on the history of the city of Miletus itself. This would be one of the most important Greek cities in Ionia, and perhaps even the Greek world during the early stages of the Archaic Age. I had originally purchased the book Miletus the Ottoman of Ionia by Professor Vanessa Gorman to help with my research around the Greek cities in Ionia, especially that of Miletus. Though after reading, I decided to reach out and see if Professor Gorman would come on the show to talk to us about the subject of their book. This would see me not go into too much detail around the city of Miletus itself in the previous episode, since today's talk will fill in a lot of the details I was originally looking to cover. In our talk today, we basically cover the earliest periods of history around the site of Miletus, which leads us into the Bronze Age and the various connections the city had. We then look at the period of the Bronze Age collapse in the region, and the period afterward that would see the arrival of the Greeks from mainland Greece. We then look at a city that would become one of the most affluent within the Greek world during the Archaic period, before we then turn to the decline of Miletus on the backdrop of the subjugation to the Lydian and then Persian empires. We then finish off with a bit of an overview of the city after the Greek and Persian wars, before then ending with a look at an open source language course developed by Professor Gorman. I hope you look forward to these areas of discussion today, but before we get started, I would like to provide some background details of Professor Gorman. Professor Vanessa Gorman received her PhD in Classical Studies at the University of Pennsylvania in 1993. Since then, she has held various positions as Associate Professor and Associate Dean, where in 2015 she became Professor of the Department of History at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, a position she currently holds to this day. In 2021, she also took on a position in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Professor Gorman's areas of expertise lay within the areas of Greek history and historiography, as well as a number of areas within Greek language. While she also focuses on Republican and Augustan Roman history and Roman historiography. For Professor Gorman, language was a huge part of her journey into understanding the ancient world, to where she would become proficient in reading ancient Greek, Latin, German, Italian and French. Her realisation of the importance of language also saw Professor Gorman create an open source course available to all called Reading Ancient Greek in the Digital Age. We also talk about this course in more detail towards the end of the discussion today. I've also provided a link to this course in the show notes on my website for this episode. Professor Gorman is the author of two books, Miletus, The Ottoman of Ionia, A History of the City to 400 BCE, Publisher, Ann Arbor, University of Michigan Press, 2001. Her second book is Corrupting Luxury in Ancient Greek Literature, co-authored with Robert Gorman, Publisher, Ann Arbor, University of Michigan Press, 2014. She is also the author of a number of articles which I've also provided links to in the show notes. Professor Gorman has also been the recipient of two prominent awards. In 2011, she received the Hazel R. McClemont Distinguished Teaching Fellow Award from the College of Arts and Sciences while in 2004 she received the Outstanding Publication Award from the Classical Association of the Middle West and South for Miletus, the Ottoman of Ionia, for best first book published since 2000 in any area of classics by any member of CAMWS. Anyway, without any further ado, let's get into today's episode and my talk with Professor Vanessa Gorman. Also, just a quick note, this talk was recorded across Zoom, so the audio quality does drop off a little. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gorman, for coming on the show to uh, talk to us about your research around the Ionian Greek city of Miletus and your book, Miletus, the Ottoman of Ionia. So um, thanks for uh, coming on to, to um, share your knowledge with us. Well, thank you for having me, Mark. Um, so I thought before we get started, I might give just a bit of a, I guess, context to our talk today in the series for yourself and perhaps for those who are new to the series as well. Um, so my series has been a bit of a uh, chronological look at Greek history. So I started back, um, I think I titled the first episode, uh, Greece Before History. And that was looking at, I think the very first um, signs of human habitation in Greek lands. And then we basically moved forward from there, going through the Bronze Age and um, uh, the sort of Iron Age, Dark Age period and into the archaic and we've just uh, I guess I spent most of last year on the Greek and Persian wars um, and 
basically when I came to the end of that, I decided to, I wanted to go back and look at uh, a bit more of the Greek periphery. So the wider Greek world and where that sort of fits into the story, because a lot of it does become, I guess, more relevant in Greece's history itself as we move forward into the classical um, age as well. So we began by looking at uh, Sicily, uh, we went through and looked at um, Thracian lands, uh, Macedonia, and then I, I decided to switch over to uh, Anatolia. And that's where our talk's going to sort of slot into is uh, around the Anatolian region. Now, a lot of these episodes I had planned on just doing sort of one episode to sort of bring it up to speed to, I guess, the end of the Greco-Persian Wars. But uh, as everyone who has been listening to my series, my episodes tend to morph into two or three on a particular subject but uh and the same things happened here on uh, anatolia i think um with our talk today i'll be doing four that all revolve around uh anatolia on the periphery now so far with anatolia i looked back at um again uh, went back to look at the earliest periods um, of human habitation and we went through uh, sort of the neolithic into the uh, bronze age uh, where we looked at the hittites as well and then from there, I sort of started shifting westward, where we started looking at uh, Western Anatolia and what was happening uh, after the Bronze Age collapse and, and that type of thing. Um, and then now I've got, uh, that's where I'm currently am in the series. And I've got two more episodes that I'm uh, doing myself, which look at the Ionians experience through uh, the revolt. Well, first of all, through um, Persians uh, subjugation of them after uh, they defeated the Lydians. And then we'll be looking at their experience through the uh, Ionian revolt that would take place. And then also how they participated in the Greek and Persian wars. And then what happened uh, after the, the Greek victory in Ionia. And that will sort of bring me up to speed. Now, what I decided to do here was, well, where we, our talk comes in is I'd actually purchased uh your book professor gorman on uh, my latest the ottoman of ionia uh to help my research around uh I, the region of ionia and my itself and i got reading through and I, I started thinking i wonder if um professor gorman would actually come on and talk to us about this instead and to my pleasant surprise you uh accepted the invitation and I, from there, I decided to not focus too much on my leaders and Ionia in too much depth in what I was doing, because I thought this would really flesh out um, uh, that sort of subject. So uh, that was good in a way. So um, yeah, it's, I'm very grateful that you decided to come on to uh, talk to us today about uh, um, my leaders and by extension, Ionia. I appreciate that, Mark, because Miletus actually was one of the most important Greek cities before Athens and Sparta were great. And because of the nature of Greek sources, most people don't realize that and never have heard of the city. And so it's nice to look at sort of that forgotten part of the Greek world that is forgotten because of the lack of sources, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's what I've, that's what I found was um, when you look at Greek history, it's Ionia is sort of treated as a bit of a, a sideshow, especially just on the backdrop of the Greek and Persian wars. Um, and it's very difficult to find out information that sort of revolves around it, uh, the region in its own right. That's not mm -hmm. connected to a, a larger event or whatever else, because when you really start looking into it, and I think what really comes through in your book too, is how the events that were taking place in Ionia were quite large in themselves. Very definitely. And, and again, at a time when Athens was still a podunk little town, many of the cities in Ionia were quite prosperous um, because of their location, because of their trade, because of their colonization. Hmm. Um, well, I thought before we get too in, down into uh, some of the details, perhaps you could um, give us a bit of a, a background to yourself uh, in academic life, where you got started and what got you into Greek history? Well, like so many people, um, I kind of grew up reading history. I was in a house full of books and I read whatever was there. And one of the books that really caught my imagination very young, in incredibly young, was Edith Hamilton's Mythology, right? Because who doesn't love Greek myths? And I know I had a kid's version of the Odyssey and I had some, my parents would buy me, you know, some of these picture books about mythology in the ancient world. And, and it just was sort of one of those things that always 
captured my imagination. Um, when I got a little older, I had two very good teachers in high school that really influenced me. One was a Latin teacher back when they still taught Latin in high schools, um, who actually uh, let me do a semester of Greek as well, because she happened to know it from her own studies. The other was a really amazing history teacher um, who he was an American historian and he should have been teaching at college, but he had some health issues that prevented him from getting his PhD. But um, the area around my hometown, which is in upstate New York, was a infamous um, US Civil War camp where a lot of people died. And he researched this and wrote the book on that camp. And, and so he really instilled in me a love of history and real methodology. He actually just lent me books and, and I just read his college books. And, and so, you know, it became a no brainer that I would do history. Um, for a while, I thought about US history, but I really, I wanted the challenge of the ancient history and the challenge is I'm not a good language person. Um, they were always my hardest subject. And so you have to do Latin and Greek if you're going to do ancient history. You also have to do French and German and Italian. And so to me, this was a challenge, but it also was what I loved the best. And so I went with it. I wound up um, getting my PhD at the University of Pennsylvania. And I went to study Roman history, but fell in love with the Greek world, also had much better advisors because there were two really amazing Greek historians there at the time. Um, John Graham, who was the expert on colonization, and Martin Ostwald, who was the expert on the Athenian democracy. And between the two of them, I got a really good education. And I saw the models for what makes a good historian. And so for me, you know, I, I still to this day think, what would John Graham think of this argument? Or what would Martin think of this argument? And so you know, I, I learned to the discipline of ancient history and classical studies and never lost my enthusiasm for the myth and for the for the stories and the romance and and you know even though I'm seeing the the bad side of things as well I mean the Athenian democracy is built on the back of slavery um, Athenian women are treated terribly um, all these kinds of elements but that's because we're human right we're people they're people we're people and it's just it's exciting to study a whole different time and frankly as a teacher it really is a is something that I can present to them without anyone having a pony in the race. So we can talk about the problems of a democracy without getting into modern American politics, but they can bring it back to modern American politics if they so choose. Or we can talk about the problems of the wealthy in a republic in Rome. So so it's it it was a kind of a circuitous journey, but in some ways a very straight one. And then I wound up getting hired at the University of Nebraska um, back in 1994. And that's where I've been in the history department and more recently joint appointment in classics. And I basically teach all the Greek history and until recently the Roman history as well. So um, it's it's been a good career for me. It's been it's been something I still enjoy my work every day. That's good. Yeah, it's good to hear. I guess it, it helps too when when you look back at uh, ancient history, you can find so many connections to, I guess, our modern world as well, which which makes it fascinating in itself. You can see where how we've um, progressed, or perhaps in some respects where we've maybe uh, got been lacking. Um, but there's there's so many uh, connections that can be made to the ancient past and traditions that seem to just be passed on through generation after generation to our time. And, and what's um, great is when the students identify those connections, when I don't have to lay it out for them, when they say, hey, this is a lot like, and, you know, this happened just today, we were talking about the Athenian law about hubris, which was a law against disrespecting citizens. And, and someone said, isn't this like, you know, how would this compare with when someone is in a restaurant and makes a pass at the waitress and, and grabs her or something. And it's, it's like, yeah, that's a lot like what we're talking about here, right? It's this disrespect, um, treating treating someone lesser than they should be. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's that's what's attracted me to, to Greek history, just finding all those, those connections. Um, so I guess that brings us to um, how you got into uh, Greek history and, and um, you, your interest with it. But you also have written a book, which I've, I've spoken about, uh, Miletus, um, The Ottoman of Ionia. 
And I guess we touched on a few of these maybe points, but um, now it's Ionia, like I've said, is sort of in the on a backdrop of the Greek and Persian Wars. That's how we we get a lot of our information to do with it is because of what's seen as a, a much larger event. So what drew you to wanting to write a book on the region of Ionia during that period and I guess the earlier history as well? Um, well, first off, I always liked the early history. Even back when I was thought I was going to do Roman history, I wanted to do early Rome, the Republic and the, and the monarchy. I like to see how things are built. How do they come together rather than how do they all fall apart? Um, and when I was working in grad school, because I had John and Martin, it was kind of a natural fit to be talking about types of government, things like that, but also especially to deal with a uh, topic that had to do with colonization. And Miletus was the biggest colonizer in the ancient Greek world. And so I happened to have a seminar paper I wrote for John Graham about an inscription called the Athenian Regulations for Miletus. And I just wasn't happy with the different editorial takes on it by different scholars. And I thought, hmm, I think I can do something with this. And that became a chapter in my dissertation. And then you know, from some somehow, I don't really re remember the process, but it stonewalled into why not write a history of the city. Now, what I wound up writing was more fit the fifth century city, the city during the Persian invasions and the Peloponnesian War, and then that the whole dissertation became a chapter in the larger book where I went backwards to the Stone Age and started at the beginning, and so. The book ends at 400 where the dissertation ends, but but it really encompasses a whole lot more material. It was just such a good fit with those advisors. And the other thing is I like being versatile. I knew at the time the job market was terrible, just as, as it is now. I wanted to be able to pitch myself as all things to all people, because a lot of times that's what you are. Um, Jim O'Donnell, the St. Augustine scholar was my advisor at the time, and he used to call me in in baseball terms, a utility infielder, right? I could play any position. And so that's kind of how I pitched myself. I could do classical studies and literature, but I also could do history. And so um, it turned out I got hired at a place where I was the only ancient historian. And so this this gave me a lot of opportunities to teach broadly, but it also trained me for that really well. So, so, you know, it, it kind of, like many things, it came along slowly. It also kind of like picking the field in the first place. All of the archaeological reports from my leaders are in German, and I knew I was going to have to get really good German to be able to do my dissertation. So still can't speak it, but I, can, I, I could read it a lot better by the time I was done because I just started with the earliest reports and read year by year all through the the excavation and found out about the city itself. And by the way, that's my background on this um, video today is, is my, this is the city of Miletus. Yep. So. <laughs> yeah. And I think um, you've done a good job too, to really highlight how the events were quite important in the region itself. Um, whereas opposed to, I guess, our ancient sources, it's, it's seen a bit as a, as a sideshow and your book really brings through that these events mattered to the people in that region. And it was, you know, the changes that were happening were life altering for those people. Whereas I guess in Herodotus, it's, yeah, it's always seen as a bit of a sideshow and just to what was happening on the Greek mainland. Right. So I guess we, well, we, we refer to Miletus and Ionia by extension as, as Greek, but they're not in Greek lands. So as in the Greek mainland. So perhaps could you give us a bit of a, an idea of, where Ionia lays and Miletus within Ionia as well, uh, in sort of relationship to the Greek mainland? Sure. Um, if you can picture the Eastern Mediterranean and picture where Turkey is today, that's the Anatolian Peninsula. And Turkey in antiquity was occupied by various Near Eastern people during the period in question, well, the classical period, it was the Persians. and Ionia was actually the very west coast of Turkey. What happened is the Greeks occupied that whole coastal region 
from a, starting at about 1000 BCE and set up a bunch of cities. And it's actually divided by dialect into different groups. But the most dominant group was in the middle, and that was the Ionians. And so we kind of called the whole area Ionia. The, the Greeks actually called it um, Asia Minor or Little Asia. Um, but the central section of the west coast of Turkey is what we think of as Ionia. And Miletus itself was about the southernmost of the cities that were considered Ionian. So it's about, I don't know, three quarters of the way down the west coast or a little bit more. It's If anyone knows the island of Samos was opposite it, you got to remember that that whole region is really volcanic. And Greece itself, the mainland, is very volcanic. It's very mountainous. It's very hard to travel over land, especially with any kind of trade goods. So the Greeks naturally, from their beginnings, looked to the sea. The sea was their highway. And so throughout this, this period, starting at about 1,000, the Greeks occupy this, this region of the Mediterranean called the Aegean Sea, the region between the Greek mainland and Turkey and bordered by Crete on the south, let's say. Um, this Aegean Sea was filled with Greek cities. And so it was, they would, they would picture themselves more as a sea with lots of cities around it rather than a mainland with some ancillary areas. So um, I think it was Aristotle or Plato who called them, um, the Greeks were like frogs sitting around a pond. Yeah. Um, and that and that's such a great image because that's really what it is. They don't go inland very far, but they but they set up along the coast and they look toward the, the um, sea. Now, Miletus itself, there's a couple of interesting things about it that I might as well mention here. It's on the mouth of something that's called the Meander River, and that's where we get the word meander because it wandered so much. It was on this peninsula that stuck up with several fingers making four nice harbors, one really good harbor, um, the Lion Harbor that they named because they put big lion statues on either side of it. And to close it, they, they strung a chain across between the two lion statues. So it was a great location for trade, but today the river has silted up and silted up. And now it's something like 10 kilometers inland. And the, the area that had been the bay is now fabulous farmland, of course, because it's it's all this very rich silt. It there was a Turkish village on the site, not a city, which makes it a lot easier to dig. Um, there was a village called Balat, B A L A T. What happened was after the Greek city, the Romans, of course, occupied it, and they built a big theater. And the top portion of the theater was used by the Byzantines even later as a fortress. And so the word Palation, palace, we get from it. Um, so Palation, or fortress, became Balat in Turkish. And then in the 1950s, there was an earthquake, and they abandoned the site and moved up the road, which left it free for the archaeologists. Unfortunately, they moved up the road, and they started digging wells and things and found that they moved it right on top of the ancient um, cemetery. So now they can't dig the cemetery because there's a village on top of it. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those stories that at least they have pretty good access to the site these days. Um, unlike so many of the sites that have, you know, Rome, Athens, you can't, you know, put a, put a shovel in the ground without finding something. Yeah, they have to be very careful about what they're uh, doing there. Well, I guess you, you've already alluded to that the Greeks weren't always at Miletus. Um, so are we able to tell when Miletus was first settled as a as a settlement, and um, can we identify who was there originally? Well, that's a hard one. Um, you've covered this on other podcasts, I'm sure, but I'm going to kind of go through it briefly. Um, there were indigenous people somewhere starting in the Stone Age. There are some Stone Age remains, but not enough to really identify who or what. Um, Certainly by the Bronze Age, there's a new people enter the whole North Euro Mediterranean region, the Indo-Europeans, coming in different waves from the area near the Caspian Sea. And the first big wave of migration from there entered um, Anatolia, probably crossing by Troy up there on the Hellespont. And they make up that great empire that is the Hittites, right, to the, to the east. And they also seem to have made up a lot of the native peoples in 
Anatolia, in Western Anatolia. Later, another wave goes into the Greek mainland, the Balkans, and that they become the, the Mycenaeans, right? The Greeks that we name after the city of Mycenae. Um, so we know that there's Indo-European living near and around, but we don't have a lot of written evidence. The city itself doesn't get founded until the Minoans get there. Yeah, that was, I guess, my next uh, question to you was um, looking at, I guess, the Minoans would be our first point where we actually see a culture come into Miletus, isn't it? And, um, yeah. and, and this is the fascinating thing, because if you start looking at all the different sources, and this is one reason I love being an ancient historian, because historians usually want written sources, but ancient historians have to use whatever you have. And so in the case of the Indo-European spread, we're looking at historical linguistics. In the case of a place like Miletus, we need the archaeology, but we also have the Hittite documents that we're going to talk about in a little while. Um, the Minoans were a people who occupied the big island of Crete, sort of halfway between the Greek mainland and Egypt. And we don't know a lot about who they were because we haven't been able to decipher their writing system. Um, the only thing they seem to agree on is that they probably weren't Indo-European. They were some indigenous native people, probably Semitic, because that's who the people in Northern Africa and the ancient Near East were, um, possibly related to the Egyptians. And they'd been there since the Stone Age. And they had a palace culture that was quite sophisticated starting in the early second century, um, sorry, second millennium BCE. And they, you know, this is the legend of King Minos, so we call it the, Mino, the Minoans, so Minos the Minotaur, all these legends set in, you know, the Bronze Age. They had a lot of trade ties. This, this was a, a nation or a people that traded all over the Mediterranean. They traded over to Italy, the Near East, Egypt, the mainland, and over in Anatolia. Now, there's legends that they had a military empire. Uh, in fact, Herodotus and Thucydides kind of do this. Thucydides said they had, they had rule over the sea. But the archaeology actually doesn't show that. It seems to be the case that they only occupied a very few places as their own settlements. Some of the islands near them, and then Miletus over on the coast of Turkey. And that makes sense because that's a great location for trading with all of the people inland and up the coast. And so Miletus was founded by the Minoans somewhere by 1700 BCE, possibly earlier, but that's the earliest that they have um, good evidence for. The reason we know that it was Minoan, and that's, this is what gets very fascinating, in the 1990s, there was this couple from Germany, Barbara and Wolf Dietrich Niemeyer, and they were digging to the Bronze Age levels at Miletus. And to do that, they had to get this enormous um, pump into the country because the groundwater was flowing in as fast as they could, dig it, they could pump it out. And so they're trying to get to these lower levels and they were just completely flooded out. So they finally, for a couple of weeks, got a really good dig near what becomes known as the Temple of Athena. And Suddenly, our whole picture of Bronze Age Miletus changed because of what they found. They identified three building levels, and the first one included Minoan building techniques and Minoan-style frescoes and some other indications that it was Minoan. But the most convincing one is that 98% of the normal household pottery, the stuff you eat on every day, was Minoan design. Some of it was imported, but, you know, they analyzed the clay and they found out that a lot of it was locally made, but along the Minoan style. So there's all these archaeological ties, which fits with the myth. And, you know, I'm a romantic. I like to believe there's some kernel of truth in most myths. It's just really hard to decide what that kernel is. Mm. Well, according to the myth, all of the myths say that Miletus was founded from Crete, often by um, Sarpedon, the great Trojan hero. Um, sometimes it involves 
a love affair with a boy named Miletus. There's also a place name on Crete called Mil Miletus, spelled with an A instead of an E. And it's the only other place in the Greek world where this name shows up. And then um, there's also a patron god at Miletus that was called Apollo Delphinius. And the Greeks made up all these myths about it, it must be the dolphin god, when in fact Delphinius is the name of a ritual on Crete. And nobody knew what it meant, so they made up these names about what it sounded like. So, so you get myth, you get the archaeological remains, and then you get these, these links between the name of the city. And I think between them, it's pretty decisive that the Minoans were the original founders of the city of Miletus around 1700, if not before. Yeah, so they become, I guess, Miletus becomes more uh, more important as a settlement rather than the little trading post that they'd set up around the Aegean and it becomes, I guess, a major center for trade uh, to connecting to the east. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially by the time it gets into the later, later levels, it has a four meter wide city wall. I mean, that's not just a little trade post. Yeah, yeah. And um, like you said, that's around, say, 1700 um, BC, we can sort of see the uh, Minoans presence in uh, Miletus, but as the Bronze Age would continue on, there would be another um, Bronze Age civilization in Greece that would, uh, I guess, rise up and become more influential in the region and absorb the Minoans. So I'm guessing they would have quickly realized the importance of Miletus as well. Is that uh, once they become more important, do we start to see them move in and um, the site become more Mycenaean rather than Minoan? That's exactly what we see. Um, the Mycenaeans really start flexing their muscles around 1500 BCE. Before that, there was a lot of trade with the Minoans, but it looks like the Minoans brought it to them. And the Minoans were definitely sort of the superior culture, but the Mycenaeans were more of a warrior culture. And somewhere around the 1450, they conquered Crete. They conquered the My Minoans and took over their lands. It seems like they, they seem to have conquered Miletus just a little bit before that, depending on how accurate the dates are, right? Archaeological yeah. dates are always got a kirka in front of them. Yeah. Um, but around 1470, that first building phase at Miletus was destroyed, and there's a clear destruction layer. And then it's rebuilt immediately, and the next phase is Mycenaean. It has Mycenaean-style building techniques. It's got Mycenaean figurines. It's got Mycenaean writing. There's a few examples of Linear B. And again, the household where that really conclusive evidence was 95% Mycenaean at this point. So they not only took over the city, but they seem to have gotten rid of the inhabitants of the city. They may have killed them all or who knows what, enslaved them. Um, and that's not terribly su surprising in this context of taking over Crete as well. Um, they would they took over a lot of the lands, unlike the Cretans, and this prosperous city over there on the Anatolian coast would have been just too too good to pass by. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess we in this period too, we see a lot more, um, I guess, correspondence, evidence of correspondence with um, the Hittite Empire in the region as well, which I'm guessing would have been, well, I guess Mycenaean influence and Hittite influence would have come right up on and, and sort of shared a, a border so we would see a lot more diplomacy and whatnot taking place yeah i mean i mean you're absolutely right because the hittite evidence in this period is wonderful because it's contemporary the hittites were this empire further to the east and they kept records they kept copies of all the royal correspondence with other kings or with with subject cities and and so these were preserved when the palace burned and the palace was in a capital city called Hattusha, which is over in central anatolia quite not that far from the modern day ankara the, the capital of turkey today um and so you have all this official correspondence and what seems to take place if you if i can grossly oversimplify this is the hittites have this empire further in the eastern and central part of anatolia but then they had um control over the west as subject states so they don't actually 
control it directly, but but they expect these people to provide the taxes when asked, provide troops when asked, and behave themselves, essentially. So instead of having the Mycenaeans and Hittites butt up against each other, there was sort of this gray area in between. And these records from the Hittites tell us that most of the time the Hittites are more interested in their eastern border. They're fighting the the Assyrians and the Mitanni and other Near Eastern people, but they also wanted to keep the peace in the West. And there's a series of, of events that we try to piece together from kind of fragmentary evidence um, where the Hittites periodically come to the West and do a little conquering when, when there's misbehavior. And one of the um, treaties is this wonderful treaty with a place variously called either Taruisa or Willowisa, which is probably Troy or Ilium. And the king there is Alexandus, who is a, which is a variation of Alexander, a name given to Paris, who started the whole Trojan War. So it seems like the long and the short of it is there's a city named Milawanda, and Milawanda is equated with Miletus. And it seems to be a possession of this other great kingdom that the Hittites call the Ahiyawa. Now you say that doesn't sound like Mycenaeans, but remember we gave the name Mycenaeans. Heinrich Schliemann made that name. At the time they called themselves Achaeans. Is one of the, that's one of the names Homer uses, Achaeans. So Ahiyawa and Achaeans are probably cognates with each other. And from the documents, it seems like Milawanda was an Achaean center but then periodically it would be used as a home base for a guy who was raiding up and down the coast and trying to set up his own little kingdom. We don't know who he was. He probably was a Hittite, but he was the father-in-law of the ruler Miletus, who seems to be related to the Achaean king. So, so we see this picture of an Achaean base city that gets into trouble because it provides a refuge for a misbehaving Hittite. And at one point, the Hittite king actually came and sacked Miletus, Milawanda. And what's really cool is this sack seems to be exactly dated to the end of the second building phase at Miletus, when around 1320, um, now it, it continues to be Mycenaean after that sack, but there's more signs of Hittite influence. So for example, one of the archaeologists describes the city wall then as an amalgam of Mycenaean and Hittite building techniques. And so it looks like a city that was the home base for some rebels. So the Hittite king came and sacked it, but then he left again. He didn't take it over, um, but he basically shook his finger at them and said, now behave from here on in. This shows you that we've got this again, this kind of no man's land, this, this tributary area of the Hittite kingdom that the Mycenaeans have a pocket in, they have a foothold in. Yeah, it, it seems that from, from everything I've read, it seems um, the Mycenaeans are obviously trying to keep a, um, a foothold in there somewhere uh, for trade purposes and keeping connections to the east. The interesting thing, I, I know you were talking about um, the, the connections with uh, Troy and the, and the Trojan War. And um, I found this interesting too with a, another um, academic that uh, being Eric Klein in his book. He, he I know he, he recently revised 1177 BC, and that's because, from what I understand, they're still uh, still uh, translating a lot of the, uh, the the tablets from Hattusa, and so more yep. information keeps coming to light and uh, whatever else. And I know he came to uh, rather than how historical was the Trojan War, he starts asking the question of uh, which Trojan War are they actually referring to? That's exactly right, because there's a several different possibilities. Um, and face it, a myth is a myth. It, it's a memory of war. It isn't necessarily accurate to one or the other. It could be an amalgam of them, but, but certainly there's several possibilities. And um, just on a side note, Eric Klein and I were grad students together. He was in the classical archaeology program when I was in the classical studies program, but we knew each other back at Penn. Yeah, and I had a, had a, had a great uh, talk with him in the in the past too. So, um, on especially a lot to do with the uh, Trojan War. I understand too that you actually have been teaching a, a bit of uh, stuff to do with the Trojan War in your classes as well. 
Yeah, I, I've developed a Trojan War course in part because of the romance of it and the idea that it's one of those unsolvable problems, which is great fodder for the students to make an, you know, make a decision of some sort and try to support it from evidence. And I can expose them to all these different kinds of evidence. And since my Miletus is at the center of all this, well, or at least one of the important places in all this, um, it's something that I, I have a little um, direct interest in. But certainly, um, Miletus was involved with this whole interaction between the Mycenaeans and the Hittites. And I guess this is all taking place, well, I guess traditionally the Trojan War is taking place in a period that's known as the uh, collapse of the Bronze Age as well. Mm -hmm. And this is where we would see the Mycenaean civilization and the Hittite civilization disappear from, from history mm -hmm. in a sense. You probably see some traits of it still uh, left over into the other civilizations and kingdoms that do do form but for the most part as an established civilization they they disappeared um what happened what happened to the city of Miletus during this period of the the collapse taking place yeah you're absolutely right there was this massive collapse in the eastern mediterranean and it was felt all the way around the eastern mediterranean in various forms um most significantly by the mycenaeans and hittites that both of these kingdoms just collapse, they basically disappear, they abandon their cities, there's a lot of signs of migrations, a lot of people moving around looking for better places, because when the cities broke down, and the centralized governments broke down, the trade routes broke down, and suddenly people who had been specialized laborers, you know, bronze smiths or, or writers or, um, you know, painters or something, suddenly they're having to feed themselves again, right? They don't have a paycheck. And so the whole cultural system broke down. We lost the writing systems of both the Hittite Empire and the Mycenaean Empire. Um, cities were abandoned and people started wandering around. This starts around 1200 BCE, it goes on on and off for the next century. Some cities fall are burned down several times. They're rebuilt and burned down again, and then they just give up. Miletus was part of this. They held on longer there than in other places. Um, it seems to be abandoned around 1100 BCE. We don't have any record of what happened. Um, it just simply that it was abandoned and it stays empty for a while um about 50 years and i guess um that would be the period too where you were alluding to where you know about a thousand bc that's when we start to see the greeks turn up on the shores of anatolia exactly um, yeah and i guess this is during i guess the the time of recovery almost during coming out of that that collapse period so what would see the greeks coming across um, the Aegean to, to settle in regions in Anatolia? So, you know, I like to describe what happens to the Bronze Age as civilization just falls off a cliff. And so we have this huge prosperity and it's like the stock market crash. Suddenly it goes straight down, but then it starts coming up and it comes up pretty steadily for the next couple hundred years. And so, you know, it doesn't stay down, in other words. And so very soon people are looking for opportunities. They're looking for better homelands. They're looking for trade. They're looking for places to farm. And we get not just big migrations around the Mediterranean, but also little migration. So a people in Northern Greece filtered down into the Peloponnesus, that big peninsula in Southern mainland, um, where many of the Mycenaean cities had been. And these were the Dorian Greeks, and there's a legend about this Dorian migration. These are the people that um, are ancestors of the Spartans, for example. And there's also a legend of an Ionian migration. And according to the legend, which is mostly in Herodotus, um, it started at Athens and they sent out sort of colonies starting around 1050 or 1000 BCE. And Miletus was supposed to be the first one. And then other cities sent more colonies and pretty soon we had these this greek colonization all along the west coast of turkey and hence we get the ionia that we were talking about before there's a lot of reasons to see some truth in these myths the dates line up um the refounded city of miletus um the new archaeology begins about a thousand bce there's also cultural similarities that indicate that 
not every colonist there need be Athenian, but certainly the leaders were because first off, they speak the same dialect of Greek. That's a good sign. But they have also cultural similarities, some of the same cults and things like that. But one of the most telling signs is they have almost the exact same calendar with calendar month names. And the Greek cities all had different calendars. I mean, if you try to date something in ancient Greece, it's a nightmare because everybody has a different calendar starting at a different time of year. But the Milesian calendar very much resembles the Athenian calendar. And then finally, later, um, we're going to get to the destruction of Miletus and the Ionian revolt. The Milesians appeal to, my, to Athens for help on the basis of their being kin. Um, and when Miletus does eventually get destroyed, the Athenians grieve for them because they were kin. So there was this sense it's it's not part of the great colonization movement because we think of that as beginning in the eighth century, but it's the same kind of thing that that Athens was like a mother city that sent out certainly Miletus, but then soon a lot of other cities um, up and down the coast of Ionia, like Ephesus and Priene and Mios and and all these other cities. They become more sort of colonies, I guess. Whereas, you know, from what I've I've read, it seems like the Ionians were quite prevalent in the Peloponnese and into regions of Attica is perhaps where the connection with Athens comes about. We talk about the dialect of Attic Ionic because they're very close to each other. And so when we talk about Ionians, yeah, you think about them as related to Attics or related to Athenian. Yeah. And, and that's in, in Herodotus, you find a lot of the, the tales of they were pushed out because of the Dorian um, migrations. Yeah. And you hear a similar story with the Aeolians up in uh, yeah. around Thessaly and into the northern parts of um, above Ionia as well. So um, with uh, the Greek settling in Miletus, um, it appears that this would become one of the first settled sites for the Greeks coming across. And then uh, I guess other colonies would follow on from there. So are we safe to assume that Miletus would become the most influential city in the region of Ionia um, during this period and sort of moving forward? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um... The title of my book comes from Herodotus, where he calls it the ornament of Ionia, the shining, the shining um, piece of jewelry of Ionia. Part of that is because a lot of these Ionian cities prospered because of trade. And as part of this trade, starting in the 8th century, a lot of Greek cities sent off colonies to various parts of the Mediterranean, not to where not to conquer, not to where there were big powers, but to go in where they were out of the way and not going to bother anyone. And they could trade with big powers nearby. Um, and so, for example, the city of Corinth on the mainland did a lot of fa uh, founding of colonies over in Italy and Sicily, as did a few other mainland cities. The Ionian cities tended to go up to the north and east, up to where Troy was and what is now the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea. And they founded most of the cities there. And of them, Miletus was the big colonizer. Um, ancients said they, that Miletus had 90 colonies. Now, clearly, they're not just trying to get rid of excess population because 90 cities is a lot of cities. They must have led these colonies but invited others to join in. And we know of archaeological remains of 45 of these. There's others that we don't know about, but the archaeology of that re region isn't very good. Neither Turkey nor Russia has invested a lot of money in, in that area. Um, but most of the Black Sea was dominated by Miletus at the time. So this is tremendous because the Black Sea was a great source of grain. Um, Southern Georgia today is still a, a breadbasket. And then also there's a lot of gold mines up in that area. And so by controlling this area, Miletus could get very, very prosperous. And most of the important cities around there, cities like Sevastopol and um, Trabzon and Varna and, and cities like that, were Milesian colonies way back when. So they can trace their roots all the way back to the Greek people there. Later on, the Ionian cities actually made an alliance of some sort, but it was really just a religious alliance. So there was something called the Pan-Ionian or the All-Ionian League, which was actually just a religious festival they came together to celebrate. Um, they tried to turn it into a defensive league later, but it didn't work out. 
And so because we don't have a lot of, we don't have written evidence from these places for the most part, we don't get the full story. And also some of these cities like Ephesus, if you go to Ephesus today, it's a fabulous city. It's a, it's a really great city to see the Roman ruins on, but the archaic city has not been found. It's probably under the river now or under, you know, at a location where they haven't been able to dig it. And so a lot of these cities, we haven't been able to get to the archaic city or the Bronze Age city. So we can't see how, how significant they were, but certainly Miletus was very prosperous at this time. Obviously it's showing that they weren't uh, operating in a vacuum either. Um, obviously the East had uh, gone through a recovery as well in many kingdoms that were forming in that region. And I think um, we see obviously going to have relationships with or uh, interactions with the uh, Phrygians. I think they're up in the northern part uh, towards the Black Sea. And I think we even hear um, uh, talk about the uh, Sumerians as well that um, that came into uh, the region at some point. But I guess we start to get uh, more of a picture of interactions that were taking place when the Lydian Empire starts interacting with um, Ionia and Miletus too, where I covered over this a little bit in, in my series, but it seems that they had an interest in there for quite some time, where over a number of generations, they were trying to exert influence into Miletus. Um, were their interests similar to the Hittites' um, point of view in this sort of respect? Kind of. Um... The stories of the Lydians, again, come from Herodotus. So we hear all these, these tales of wars that last several generations um, as the Lydians tried to attack the coastal cities. And I'm sure they wanted the coastal cities because of their money, because of their prosperity. The Lydian was more of an in, inland empire. Um, and what happened was they essentially took city after city individually because again, the Ionians weren't unified. And Miletus for a while was able to keep its independence. The story in, in Herodotus is really kind of cool because it says the Lydian king attacked and while he was attacking, he burned down a temple of Athena that was out on the periphery of the Miletian territory. And then he fell ill and was on death's door and the God told him he had to rebuild the temple to appease Athena. And so he built two temples instead. And what's cool is they've actually found the archaeological remains of a twin temple that has some offerings to Athena at it in a, in a town in the territory, in a town called Assessos, um, in the territory of Miletus. So again, we get myth and archaeology re reinforcing each other, and I always am really happy when that happens. Um, eventually, Ath uh, Miletus does wind up being a subject when the famous King Croesus takes it over and then eventually Croesus loses to Persia and the Persians take it over. They tried to turn the Pan-Ionia into a defensive league at that point. There's a story that they met and said, look, if, you know, if we don't do work together, you know, we're just, they're just going to pick us off individually. And they couldn't come to an agreement. So that's exactly what happened. The Persians just took them individually, city by city. That was their great mistake. They never unified. And so they couldn't exert any kind of force. So Miletus was one of the cities that became subjects to Persia. Yeah. And from what I know, like, during this whole period of um, uh, the Lydian sort of influence and into Persian, we often hear too that all the Ionian cities would become subject or uh, would uh, lose their independence, but Miletus was able to keep some sort of agreement with the Persians. I mean, there's no, I don't see anything that elaborates on what this agreement was or. This, this is the problem because originally Herodotus says they were able to keep their independence, but then the next time we meet them, they're definitely not independent. So somewhere he's missed mm. part of the story because they were as dependent as the others. And by dependent, I mean, like many subject cities, they owed tribute and they probably and they owed soldiers when called upon. So that's what it means to be dependent on the Persians. Yeah, I was always a bit curious whether, because of their um, status as a major trading port, whether they were able to get some sort of concessions that other um, cities weren't able to to get, just because of the the wealth that could be generated through, I guess, a, a cleaner 
sort of take over? Possibly, but it's actually more likely that they were more eager to take them over because of the wealth they generated. And, you know, maybe they did a deal. It's hard to know. Herodotus is, is aggravatingly um, silent on certain issues. So we just have to take what he gives us. Yeah. <laughs> and then try and uh, work the rest out from there. Well, I guess in this period too, this is where we've you've already spoken about how Miletus became, oh, I know, I knew, became, it was a much more prosperous region than what a lot of the cities on uh, mainland Greece were at this stage as well. Before there were um, our greater cities on uh, on the mainland Greece, such as Athens and Sparta and, and whatever else would sort of rise to prominence, Miletus would um, hold the mantle of one of the greatest Greek cities, I guess, in terms of its cultural achievements uh, during the archaic period. Um, so what are some of the main areas that would be seen to have advanced greatly in this respect and perhaps some figures around these ideas? Well, again, we're very limited by the evidence. And most of that evidence consists of quotes in later authors. You have to understand that before about 450, our written sources are few and far between. They have writing by about 750s when they start using the alphabet borrowed from probably the Phoenicians. It's a Semitic invention. Um, but there just aren't many things that survive. They weren't written on durable surfaces or something like that. Having said that, it's pretty clear that Miletus was kind of the ancient equivalent of a university town. There were lots of intellectuals that were famed as Milet Miletians. And we see a few poets that grow up there. We get fragments of some early poets, but the real fame for the city comes if you ever study a beginning history of philosophy course, because three of the most famous early philosophers um, were from Miletus. Before Socrates, we, we call them the pre-Socratic philosophers. Um, they studied what we would think of more as, as the science of the natural, natural world you know, what is the first element, what is the sun, that kind of thing. And this seems to have been invented, as far as we're concerned, by a guy named Thales, who was a Milesian, um, probably living in the 6th century. So he was supposed to have predicted a solar eclipse, for example. He thought that everything that was in um, existence came from an original element, and that original element was water. So his theory was that water was the first thing that it makes up all other things. He had a student named Anaximander, who was also one of the very first people to write in prose rather than poetry. Even if it was philosophy, they would write it in poetry. And he wrote a, a book called, well, a work called About Nature. And he also thought that there was some first element, but he called it the infinite or the indefinite or the the unending it's hard to know it's hard to translate the word limitless and he also thought for example that the earth was a big cylinder suspended in the middle of a bunch of rings that were the stars so this is kind of heretical right that the earth is the shape and that the stars are not gods and and you know the sun is not the sun god and and things like that um he mapped this perfectly circular earth his influence is seen because everyone who comes after him has to respond to him. So he becomes sort of the standard. And his student, who was Anaximenes, they call him more thorough and systematic. Um, he thought that the first element was some kind of air or divine breath. Um, and he also mapped an earth, but his earth was a disc rather than a cylinder, a disc that sort of rested on the cushion of air like a hovercraft kind of thing. Um, so, so this whole idea of the beginning of pre-Socratic philosophy dates to Miletus and then spreads throughout the Greek world. There's also an early school of prose writers. We call them logographers, so people who write logos or stories. And they kind of wrote this not quite history, but trying to be history. They would write local stories, but they would always begin with the gods and move into human, as if this was all part of one succession. Um, and they tended to write local histories. And so there was a famous one called Hecateus, who was from Miletus, and his he wrote about myths and he wrote about geography. So he was most famous as a geographer. He 
made an early map, which might be the map that Herodotus mentions when, when he talks about the Ionian revolt. And he's, what I really like about Hecateus though, is he was trying to reject the gods. One of the things that Herodotus does as the father of history is he doesn't say the gods caused something to happen. He talks about how people believe in the gods and that belief causes things to happen. But he doesn't say Zeus came down and caused, you know, a storm or something like this. So he's one of the first people to separate causation from the gods. Well, Hecateus starts his account, and this is almost all that we have of it. We have a few lines. He says, the tales of the Greeks are many and laughable, as it seems to me. So he's he's begins this skeptical account. And I'm sure this is the kind of thing that influenced Herodotus as he was inventing history per se. He was kind of this halfway between telling myths and writing history. And so you see Miletus is, have all these little influences. You know, of course, we've lost most of it, but there's all kinds of signs that there was prosperity in the city and that there was an intellectual life that's going to transfer to Athens in the fifth century because Athens will become the big intellectual center all through into Roman times as well. Yeah, and that's, I guess, with Herodotus, it's our first, well, our oldest complete work of what we would call yes. history. But it's showing that um, for us, it seems like that's where history started, but we only see little snapshots or fragments that show that he's probably building on a tradition that was building over generations there to start with. And he was just the latest irradiation of it. Yeah, but he also, he was remarkable. I mean, there's no question. Even the ancients called him the father of history. Um, although, as Cicero said, the father of history and the father of lies. Um, mm. But you can't overestimate how important Herodotus was in separating the gods from the story in trying to make sense out of things, trying to use reason to, to figure out causes instead of just repeating mm. stories that were told to him. And he seems to, I guess, by building on the traditions, I mean, he's taking from what we would call geographers, but he's got a little bit of geography within his work, but there's history. I mean, you could even argue that there's bits of philosophy, how he, yeah. he has certain characters interact with each other. Is, there's oh, all sorts of elements to, to the work. Absolutely. Political theory, all kinds of things going on there. Um, it, it, it sounds like grandma our grandfather telling stories but it's actually quite sophisticated and has a lot of moral elements as well so yeah herodotus's accomplishment is just astonishing and he deserves the name father of history hmm. every time i read that book i always discover something new that i hadn't uh, figured out before um well i guess as we head to start to head towards the, um, the classical period transitioning from the sixth into the fifth century um, that's when we start to see cities like Athens and and Sparta and I guess they're two major ones, but they start to rise to more prominence uh, during that period. Um, and they would start to develop their own cultural importance as well. And we would see a lot of the ideas that had developed in Ionia transition over into the Greek mainland while they were rising up. So does this start to see Miletus um, fade into the background uh, from a that sort of cultural importance standpoint. I mean, I get the feeling that the Lydians and then the Persians um, control within the region probably might have had something to do with their prosperity uh, sort of coming towards it, towards an end. Well, I wouldn't describe it as fading into the background. They were more um, shoved in, out of the picture completely very quickly. And it all has to do with the Persians. Um, in 499, the Ionian world rebelled from Persian control. And the rebellion started with the leader at Miletus. And it actually was, it's a kind of funny story I'm not going to try to go into, but he bit off more than he could chew and found himself owing the Persians a lot of money. And so he decided, let's rebel. And the Persian controlled leaders of all these Ionian cities were so unpopular that the Ionian people were happy to get rid of them. But then they realized, what have we done? You know, because this is this tiny little group of cities against this mighty empire of the Persians. They asked help of the Spartans, who, when they realized how far away it was, said, get lost. But then they asked help of the Athenians, who, on the basis of their kinship, sent them some ships 
Um, and Herodotus says, says those ships were the beginning of evil for the Greeks because those ships are going to be the excuse the Persian kings later uses to invade Greece. But meanwhile, we have this Ionian revolt and they have some initial successes, but it's just a matter of time before this monstrously big empire gets its act together and gets its army from all the far reaches of its world and came in and by 494, so it started in 499, by 494, they were able to conquer the all of the Ionians. They took Miletus and made Miletus an example. So because it was the ringleader, they, according to Herodotus, killed all the men, but then the ones that were surviving, so clearly they didn't quite kill all the men, um, and the women and children were all transported to a city on the Persian Gulf. And this is something the Persians did sometimes. You don't want to kill everybody. There's no one to work the land and pay tribute. So you move them so that they, you break up their local influence. So they moved all the inhabitants that survived way far away and burned down the city and gave the land to the native Carians. And as Herodotus says, thus Miletus was empty of its inhabitants. It's so shocking. He doesn't even mention that the city was burned to the ground. But this is very, very clear in the archaeological evidence. There's a clear burn layer all through the city. And there's also a big mound south of the city that is essentially the rubble from the destruction in 494. And it's never been dug properly. So it's going to be a gold mine when they do. So after the Ionian Revolt was settled, of course, the Persians turned their attention to Greece proper, and we get the two big Persian invasions, and they were eventually beaten back. And then Miletus gets refounded. And my personal theory, which John Graham liked, so I'm good with it, is that people came back from their colonies. So, so when you got made a colony, you would send off one of your sons to the colony. So you'd have a trade alliance within your family. So relatives were in the different cities. So it seems to be the case that people came back from the various colonies and refounded the mother city. And it was refounded remarkably because it was laid out with what we call an orthogonal street plan. That is, it had straight streets meeting at right angles. And this was the first city that was laid out entirely on a grid. And it was probably a design that they developed as they were making all these colonies, right? Because if you're going to make a new city, the obvious thing is to lay out a grid and everybody gets an equal piece. Um, so it became known as for its orthogonal city. In fact, one of its inhabitants is supposedly the inventor of orthogonal city planning, which is, I've actually written an article where I say he's not the inventor, he just popularizes it. He goes on later to plan out the port city of Athens, for example. But meanwhile, Miletus is never going to be prominent again. Be by the time it's rebuilt, Athens is a massive naval empire. Sparta is this huge land empire. And Persia is the big bad to the east. And so in the course of the, the 50 years after the uh, the Persian invasions, the Athenians built a naval empire in the Aegean Sea, and Miletus was one of its, its, they called them allies, but they treated them like subjects. They treated them really poorly. And during the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, the Spartans actually made a deal giving Ionia back to the Persians if the Persians would fund a Spartan navy. So Miletus went back into Persian hands by the end of the Peloponnesian War, it was actually the Spartan base in that area for their for their navy. So Miletus is going to, you know, keep up as a city for a long time, but it's never again going to be prominent. It's it's one of the cities that Alexander the Great um, had to sack, and his name actually appears on the list of eponymous officials. So the 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 guy who's puts his name on the calendar each year. So there's Alexander on there one year. Um, and he also helped build the, the version of the big oracle at Didyma that was in uh, Milesian territory. It was the second most popular oracle after the one at Delphi. Um, and there's this massive structure there today that Alexander helped fund. It never finished, but it's it's an amazing place to visit. Um, one of the best 
Greek ruins I've ever been to, I think. Um, so, so it's going to remain a prominent city, but never a dominant city ever again. Yeah, so it's um, seen its heyday as, I guess, um, the classical period came, yeah. well, from the, the Persian subjugation, that's when you really start to see um, it losing its influence in the in the area and, and whatnot. But um, well, I guess that kind of brings us up to the time period that um, I was looking at in the series at the moment, where we were looking at the, a lot of these regions up to the end of the, the Greek and Persian wars. And you've given us a bit of a, a taste of what's to come in the region as well. But um, I'd like to once again thank you for uh, coming on to the show to uh, to talk about um, Miletus and expanding our uh, knowledge. And um, I also want to highly recommend your book Miletus, the Ottoman of Onia, to everyone. It's um, like I said, I found it's when it's been difficult to find information on what's happening in Ionia and the importance of the region. Everything you find in the historical record, it's almost comes across a secondary importance to the events taking place in in Greece. Part of the part of the problem there is that the you've got individual archaeological reports from all these cities, but because there wasn't a lot of historical record, you need to do what I did and look at all the different sources and put together a coherent picture. And people haven't done that for too many of these cities and not for the whole area since I think the latest book on the area was in the 1960s or mm -hmm. something, long before a lot of this stuff was discovered. So, I mean, really, it needs someone who's very archaeologically savvy to to make an overall history of the region and i'm just not it i'm too much of a historian and i don't want to read all those german archaeological reports forever um and i've moved on to other things but i hope someone undertakes it it's a huge job but but to do a history of the region proper would be a fabulous service for the profession and for the world mm. but i think what you've done is made it very accessible so you've presented the region of Ionia and its its importance to a larger degree than I guess what you get from reading the ancient sources where you've tried to show it in its own right and but you've done it in a way that makes it quite easy for just everyday readers to to pick up and and get a, a, to grips with as well. Well I'm glad to hear that because it is it is a scholarly work complete with lots of footnotes but I think there are areas of it that are probably tough slogging for someone like you, but there's a lot of it, I think, I hope is very accessible. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I noticed. It's uh, probably one of the most referenced um, books I've come across in a while, which is very helpful too, when you actually want to try and find the information from the sources. So um, that uh, was very good to see. Um, but anyway, I thought before we do uh, finish up, I just want to You've already, uh, we've already spoken about how you still uh, teaching uh, ancient Greek history um, in the university, but you also have a language course that you have developed. So I thought perhaps before we go, you could tell us a bit about uh, the course that you have developed and um, how people could get involved in it. I would be delighted because this has become my passion of late. Um, it started not quite 10 years ago. Um, there's a program that was developed at Tufts University. There's a very famous website called the Perseus Project that, that most classicists know, especially as a place where you can get original text and translations of most ancient works. And the original texts are tied into a dictionary and they do analysis so you can see what form it is. So an offshoot of Perseus is something called Perseids, makes sense, child of Perseus. And one of its big functions is that you can make what we call tree banks, which is grammatical trees of sentences. And I was one of the people that helped develop the program. They, they developed it, as they say, wires exposed. So we were working carefully with the programmer as it was being developed and finding flaws and, and beta testing. And I worked especially on the Greek material and over time, I mean, it got kind of addictive for a while. So it was like playing a video game. You know, I got to do just one more sentence and just one more sentence. And I've since put together a repository on GitHub, which is an open access site for humanities data. And I've got over 600,000 tokens of Greek on there, Greek prose, that I've personally hand annotated. Now, people at in 
at Leuven have used it to teach their computer to do trees now. And other, uh, other um, people do trees in different languages using something called dependency syntax usually. And my husband and I work together using this data that I've produced and other people have produced to do authorship studies. So um, we're trying to use grammar alone to determine who's the author of something. And we're getting fabulously good results with this. And so I, we're about to turn it to, so for this, this summer, our project is to compare the speeches of Demosthenes to some of these so-called pseudo Demosthenes speeches and to see if they're written by the same guy, a different guy, are the, are the pseudo Demosthenes written by different people? There's, there's these authorship questions we want to apply this to. But meanwhile, after all these years of making trees, I realized this is a great way to teach Greek because people like me who don't like to just sit there and memorize paradigms and memorize paradigms, and then I never see these paradigms that I've memorized. And I decided to make an approach to learning Greek language and Latin as well that is minimizing the memorization because we've got tools now. You can just click on a word and it will tell you what the form is and it will link you to the dictionary. So why memorize all of this data or this information when you can get it at the click of a button? What you need instead is to know what to do with the information you get. So if it says it's an, an accusative, what does that mean? If it says it's subjunctive, what does that mean? So I teach my students this grammar and the language of language that's applicable in any language. And I use these trees to show them the structure of, of the sentences. And, and so I have developed a beginning Greek class that I've made. It's a free class online for anybody who wants to play with it. And so if you go to GitHub and look for Gorman and Greek, you'll find my website. And it's just an open access website for anyone to learn Greek. And my idea is you can be up and running reading Greek in a very short time instead of being bogged down for several years before you can read anything real. Yeah, and uh, that's definitely one of my uh, weaknesses is actually reading Greek. Um, I've been lucky where I actually work with a, uh, a Greek man, so he's uh, given me a lot of uh, help along the way too with, um, I guess, some pronunciation and uh, understanding of what certain words mean and, and are, but I think I'll be definitely checking out your course that you offer. Well, I hope so, because I want it to be more accessible to more people. I don't want it to be something only the elites can study. I just think it's it's fantastic, it's fun, and you can get a good understanding without so much work because you're understanding language if you can understand english you can understand greek right you're just transferring it to something else yeah oh well um once again i'm extremely grateful that you've come on the show to give us some of your time and i'm sure many people have uh, learned a lot from your talk today um i definitely have learned uh, uh, extra bits and pieces that are going to be quite helpful so um once again thank you for coming on the show uh, professor gorman well, I've really appreciated talking to you today, Mark. I hope everyone enjoyed today's episode, where we finished our look at the Greek periphery in Anatolia. I trust the talk today filled in a lot of the gaps around Miletus and Ionia that I had left a little open in the previous episodes. Professor Gorman was truly a wealth of knowledge in this area and saw myself gaining a lot out of the talk we had. I hope you also gained much from it as well. I would highly recommend picking up a copy of Miletus, The Ottoman of Ionia, if this part of Greek history interests you. You will find much more detail around a lot of the areas we spoke about today, while the book also travels up to 400 BC, expanding on where we left proceedings today. If you head to the episode page at castingthroughancientgreece.com, you will find links to Professor Gorman's books, articles, and her open source language course. So this now sees us at the end of our series of Greek periphery episodes, looking at the wider Greek world leading up to the classical period. As we move forward, these regions would become more integral to events in Greece, so we will be looking at them as we continue with our narrative. But hopefully, I have given a good foundation to help with the context as we move forward. Next episode, we will be beginning our look forward after the Greek victory over the Persians during their invasions of Greece. This will be seeing us departing from Herodotus as one of our foundational sources and instead moving on to Thucydides. So, to begin this transition, I'll be presenting an episode that will be giving us an introduction to Thucydides and his main topic, the Peloponnesian War.
To help me do this, I'll be once again releasing a guest interview, this time with Professor James Rom, author of Ghost on the Throne and the Sacred Band, to name a couple of his books. Recently, Professor Rom was involved in the release of a work called The Greek Histories, which was a look at some of the foundational ancient Greek writers, with Thucydides being one. So, I trust our talk will prove to be a good foundation on the period that we'll be spending quite some time on. Thank you everyone for your continued support, and a big shout out to all those who have found some value in the series, and have been supporting it on Patreon, and other various ways. Your contribution is truly helping me grow the series. If you have also found some value in the show, and wish to support the series, you can head to www.castingthroughancientgreece.com and click on the support the series button, where you can discover many ways to extend your support in helping the series grow. Be sure to stay connected and updated on what's happening in the series, and join me over on Facebook or Instagram at Casting Through Ancient Greece, or on Twitter at Casting Greece. And be sure to subscribe to the series over at the Casting Through Ancient Greece website. I hope you can join me next time for episode 50, Introducing Thucydides with Professor James Rom. <laughs>